Hello everybody, good evening and welcome to tonight's event, a virtual celebration of Simon Newman's very recently published University of Press book, Freedom Speakers. Panels such as tonight are an important, or important recently published books, are a new venture for the RHS and we hope to develop this alongside our existing events programmes of lectures and training workshops. But I'd like to start by introducing our speakers. Our panel brings together three experts in black history in the early modern transatlantic world. Professor Simon Newman is a historian of early modern America and the British Atlantic world, and was until recently a professor of history at Glasgow University. Since 2019, Simon has been based in the United States as a senior fellow at the Institute for Research in the Humanities at the University of Wisconsin, and currently as visiting scholar in the Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History at Harvard. In recent years, Simon has played an important role for the Royal Historical Society as our Vice President for Publishing, and he was one of the creators of our new historical perspective for historians, which is also published, like tonight's book, Open Access by the London University of London Press. Joining Simon this evening are two fellow historians of early modern racial slavery, both of whom ideally placed to comment on Simon's book. Corinne Fowler is Professor of Postcolonial Literature at the University of Leicester and the Director of the Colonial Countryside National Trust Houses Reinterpreted Project. As many of you will know, this is a project bringing together authors, historians, and primary school pupils to explore the Caribbean and the East, Engli East India Company connections of selected country houses owned by the National Trust. Her latest book is Green on Pleasant Land, Creative Responses to Rural England's Colonial Connections, published in 2020. Joining Corin and Simon tonight is Gretchen Gazina, who has done more than anyone to record and bring to our attention the lives and experience of the black community resident in early modern and Victorian Britain. Many of you will know her studies of Black London, Life Before Emancipation, and Britain's Black Past, published in 2020, and based on her earlier 10-part BBC Radio 4 series of the same name, which revealed the lives of black people who settled in Britain in the 18th and 19th century. Gretchen is also Professor of Biography and English at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and like Simon, joins us today from the East Coast. We're going to uh, invite commentaries from our panelists. Uh, we're going to start with Simon. Simon, um, I'd just like to start by saying what a fantastic book it is. Here it is. It's available free open access and also in hard copy. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to pass the microphone to you. Thank you, Emma. I'm going to start by uh, sharing my screen. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you and with Gretchen and Corinne, and I'm very grateful to the Royal Historical Society for hosting this event. It's lovely to be able to talk about the book. Um, okay, let's see if I can advance the slide. Whoops. My book, Freedom Seekers, builds from more than 200 advertisements like these, all of them published in London's newspapers during the half century between 1655 and 1704. In most cases, the few dozen words of an advertisement are the only surviving evidence of the existence and the presence in London of a person who may well have been enslaved and who had resisted their situation by escaping. This is an example of the silence of the archive in which key figures, in this case, African or South Asian people in 17th century London, are all but absent from and almost completely silent in surviving archival records. Even these advertisements contain the words of enslavers, not the enslaved themselves. I've tried to use my research as the foundation for reimagining 17th century London as a society in which enslaved and free African and South Asian people were present and active, and to learn what I can about their lives and experiences and the significance of these advertisements and the stories they tell more broadly. This is a work of historical research, but I've sometimes used imagery and prose to imagine these people and their experiences. And beyond my new book, I've collaborated with Spread the Word and with Ink, Sweat and Tears in working with young Black and South Asian poets and creative artists who've taken this research even further in imagining London's freedom seekers. As you can see, these advertisements appeared alongside others for lost or stolen property, including horses, dogs, um, various goods, or advertising goods for sale, such as books and medical cures, as well as advertisements for white servants who'd left their employers or military deserters. The point here is that to readers of these newspapers, a short notice like the second one here was just one more newspaper advertisement. It tells us that racial slavery was normalized and unremarkable. 
when 17th century white London, Londoners saw African or South Asian people in the city, they saw nothing untoward, even if some were enslaved children who were branded or who had silver or brass collars around their necks. I have researched each advertisement as best I can, building a picture from whatever scraps of information I can piece together. In this case, I was able to establish that John Woodfine was a successful and wealthy slave ship captain, and that he made enough money from the trade to acquire Ratcliffe Manor for himself and his family, and then to leave substantial property bequests to his children. Woodfine had returned to London on the slave ship John Bonaventure just a few weeks before Goode escaped. Slave ship captains were entitled to bring one and sometimes more enslaved people for themselves in each cargo of enslaved people they took to the new world, and they could either sell them in the colonies or bring them back to London. Good, speaking little or no English, had almost certainly arrived in, in London on the John Bonaventure as Captain John Woodfine's property. The ship had acquired enslaved people from Ardra on the Bight of Benin, and at this time many of the people loaded onto ships there had come from Oyo-speaking peoples in the interior, especially from the Kingdom of Dahomey. Male names like Ogudo, Agodi, Adagud, Gude, and Gudo were all common in this region, so it seems very possible that this was where Gude had come from and that the name we see here was an anglicized spelling of his name. When the John Bonaventure had left Africa, there'd been 582 enslaved people aboard, 16% of them children. But by the time the ship reached Jamaica, almost one quarter of them had died. In this period, wealthy white Londoners enjoyed displaying young black boys as well-dressed servants. However, these enslaved boys grew older in a society with few of the restrictions faced by the enslaved in the colonies, and some might become unruly in the eyes of their enslavers. For example, in 1688, Samuel Pepys and his wife grew tired of and even scared of what he described as the mischievous behavior of Sambo, who'd grown from a governable boy into an independently minded man. Pepys arranged to have Sambo forcibly returned to the Caribbean and once there sold to a planter. And there are other examples of this kind of, of action. We do not know what happened to Gould, Although we can think about the trauma this 17 year old had experienced over the preceding year and why he might have chosen to escape shortly after arriving in London. Was his escape successful? And if so, where did he go and what did he do? Was he recaptured? And if so, how did his life play out? Did he like Sambo eventually get sent back to the, the colonies? One of the challenges I faced in writing this book was showing readers that what existed in 17th century London really was racial slavery. After all, both the descriptions and advertisements as well as contemporary portraits of elite English people attended by young black people, show the enslaved, especially young boys, as human status symbols, enabling white people to flaunt both their wealth and its colonial source. Many of these enslaved attendants were very well dressed in expensive liveries. Some even sported expensive silver or brass collars. Compared to many working people in England at this, this time, these enslaved boys often looked relatively privileged, working in the homes of wealthy people, well-dressed and well-fed. And of course, they look nothing like enslaved people in the Caribbean. This can make slavery in London appear somewhat benign when compared with the savagery of plantation slavery and the Middle Passage. But we need to remember that many like Good had experienced the trauma of separation from family and community in Africa or South Asia at a very young age, that he and others had endured the Middle Passage on horrific slave ships, and some had spent time on plantations in the colonies. So while we associate the violence and savagery of racial slavery with colonial plantations, slavery in London may have been just as traumatic for isolated African and South Asian children. And just like Sambo in the household of Samuel Pepys, enslaved people in London were always at risk of being returned to colonial slavery. So slavery in London, I would say, was real. Now I'd like to show you a couple of maps from the book to give you a sense of the geography of escape from slavery in 17th century London. And this map shows the locations that I know of from which freedom seekers escaped. Um, you see them developing over time. People escaped from locations all over the London area, but over time we see, and you'll see this at the end, there were clear focal points, one in the financial hub of the city of London and another in the Maritime East End. And this map shows locations in the city of London to which recaptured freedom seekers could be returned. The map includes coffee houses and financial and imperial institutions such as the Royal Exchange, the headquarters of the Royal African Company and the East India Company. Once again, we can see how the city of London and especially these coffee houses, for example, Lloyd's, uh, formed a hub for the capture and return of freedom seekers. And 
this is the, the, the financial city of London. The other main hub for the return of freedom seekers was the East End. Whoops. Um, in my book, I argued um, that runaway slave advertisements were invented in London and used there for 50 years before they first appeared in colonial newspapers. The first of these colonial newspaper advertisements appeared in 1704 in Boston, and after that, tens of thousands of advertisements like that were published in North American and Caribbean newspapers. For historians today, these are some of the most important records we have of widespread resistance to slavery. But runaway advertisements have been invented in London, and this helps highlight how the development of racial slavery was as much an English as a colonial phenomenon. I've tried to tell the story of the development of ideas about how to control and recapture freedom seekers in London's newspapers as part of that story and how it reflects the larger significance of London in the creation of slavery more broadly. An interconnected network of aristocrats, gentry, merchants, bankers, coffee shop owners, craftsmen, shipwrights, ship captains and others emerge in London in these newspaper advertisements, revealing the web of connections between those who owned or benefited traffic and expectations of people. But the advertisements also reveal the presence of enslaved and free African and South Asian people in London. Hundreds more appear in London parish records of baptisms, marriages, and burials. And through these sources, we see that enslaved and free people were a significant presence in the city. In the end, we cannot know what happened to Goode and to many more like him, and whether or not he was able to join London's community of free people. But we do know that just before Christmas, 1686, a holiday that meant nothing to him and in a city and country he did not yet know, this teenager had the audacity and the courage to resist his bondage by attempting to escape. And that is no small thing. Um, with that, I will stop screen sharing and hand over to Gre um, Gretchen. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Simon. I, first, I'd like to say what a pleasure it is to, to be with you all today and to to discuss this wonderful book, which is shedding so much light on a period that so few people know about. As you know, um, some of you know from the introduction, I have written and edited several books on Black Britain, primarily on the long 18th century, but also um, in the 19th century. Professor uh, Newman and his team contributed a chapter to the book Britain's Black Past that I did a few years ago that was based on a BBC Radio 4 series that he also appeared on. And in that, I traveled all over to find these forgotten stories of people who had lived and been forgotten um, from Glasgow down to, to out to Wales and down to London and all over as far as we could go. I do remember meeting Simon and his team in Glasgow, a trip I made by train in one day and back in the same day from, from London. I've also done a lot of uh, podcasts on the subject and I'm really surprised by the number, well, I'm very pleased to say that the number of people who are so interested in this subject. So this book couldn't be published at a better time. Um, I wanted to say that a couple of things. One is that I think it's really important to think about trying to bring black people back not just into the picture because what we lack is their voices. What we have are the voices of the white people who kept records of them. And in very few places do we get the black voices. Obviously we have books like Equiano and Cugolano and others, but even today, I think it's very important that we th start thinking about bringing people of color into this conversation and to benefit from all of this wonderful research that has been going on. I wanted to just mention that I first got into this field because I was in London and I was looking for Simon, I mean, Simon, sorry, Steve, uh, Peter Fryer's wonderful book, Staying Power, which had just been published in paperback and hadn't been available before. And I was very excited to be able to get the paperback copy. And I went up to the clerk and I said that I was looking for this book. And she looked at me and said, Madam, there were no black people in Britain before this act before 1945. And I said, oh, yes, there were. And she said, in no numbers. And she couldn't find the book, which turned out to be on the shelf and just refused to believe that this was a population that even existed. And I went home and started working in this field and it changed my life. Professor Newman's book fills an important gap 
in the history of Black people in early Britain, while Miranda Kaufman's book, Black Tudors, discover, uh, discusses an earlier era, and my work in that of many others concentrates on the 18th century when the population was probably at its peak, um, at least in early Britain, Freedom Seekers looks at the period in between those. And by looking at Restoration London, it fills in the gap between those periods, showing not only the presence, but the continuing presence of a Black population, much of it, but certainly not all, enslaved. In my teaching, especially when I live in England, I'm amazed at the number of people who don't know this history. I can't tell you the number of young Black people in Britain who say, I had no idea we were here. So this book is a major, major uh, addition to that record. And I think people will be having some wonderful conversations around this for a while. I'm gonna turn this over to Professor Corinne Fowler who will take it up from her research. Thank you very much. I'm hoping that you can see my slides. Um, yeah, I just want to endorse what's already been said about the importance of this book in filling an important gap, and it's a great resource on so many levels. Um, one of the things that I contributed to as a co-editor was the National Trust Report on its houses, connections to various aspects of colonial activity. And, I say a co-editor co because it was simply an audit of other historians' excellent work in the area over the past few years. But one of the aspects of the report, which didn't get much looked at, was the, its reference to African and Indian pres presences on National Trust-owned estates. And this is one of them, um, example here from Chalcot Park in Warwickshire which was one of the colonial countryside properties. And the historian who supported this work was Dr. Kate Donington, who was fantastic to work with. And this painting here is of Captain Lucy from 1680. And the, the reason I'm mentioning this portrait is, is in conjunction with um, what Simon's already talked about, but the, the fact that Miranda Kaufman and colleagues have found some 300 or more of such examples of paintings which are in country houses, not just belonging to the National Trust, but to uh, privately owned country houses throughout the land. And I think that it's important also beyond this really important book to think about the regional African and Indian presences during this period. And portraits like this have led on to finding other very localized examples of the Indian and African presence at, at this time. And this is one such example. So this here is an example of some of the documents which have been looked at by local historians um, in 2007 and even earlier. And in those parish records near Chalcot Park, they found reference in 1689 to somebody called Margaret Lucy. There is a grave there that you can see on the right hand side, another important piece of evidence to Mertilla mentioning the Arabian island where she was transported from. A 1700 parish record of Will Archers, possibly the boy in the painting and a 1735 reference to Philip Lucy. And there is another contemporary document which is showing that there was a young boy, it's a visitor to Chalcot Park, who said there was a young African boy serving hot chocolate to Catherine Wheatley, who was married to Captain Lucy. And I think beyond the evidence, we also need to think about the ethical dimensions of talking about representing this history, as has already been referred to. And some of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with a very short essay by Patterson Joseph about the almost systematic uh, ignoring of black sitters by art historians over the, the decades of children, often children, who, who were trafficked in this way. 
And word choices also matter, which is why I like the phrase so much, freedom seekers. And as part of the Colonial Countryside Project, I felt it was very important to commission writing on this topic. And I think that Simon and I are very much on the same page here, as is Gretchen, on the importance of thinking through, through literary expression, the, the human dimensions of these circumstances. And these sorts of writings really help people to connect with the evidence on that more human level, emotional level. And, and this poem um, here, which I'm, I've got uh, on this slide is They Have Named Me, page by Seni Senif Ratney. I'll just briefly read it. A word they use for the flimsy things inside the leather bindings they call books that fill the shelves in a room they call a library. When they brought me here, the strange sounds that passed between them were like stones falling on my head until I learned to look for meanings. Now I can match their words to concrete things and even read emotions in the foreign language of their faces, but I will not let my tongue curl around the sound of them. Silence is my refuge. I have the lock and the key. I'll not open the door. Some pages may offer words. This page is silent. Now, as part of the colonial Countryside Project, we produced a, an online open course, Country Houses and the British Empire. And in this course, in week five, we've got a, a whole section on finding, locating these sorts of presences. Um, but we've also got in the final week, Seni Senivaratni talking in a video about the emotional labor of doing this kind of work, which is a really important consideration. She talks about her own sadness about the history, about dealing with other people's anger and resistance to talking about this history and the feeling of sometimes creeping in to do the work and then creeping out again. I think it's really important to talk about that as well. And then just to get back to what I was saying earlier about the significant amount of research which remains to be done in the regions also, I wanted just to mention briefly the example of Whitehaven, which is actually quite a small port in the northwest of England. And archivists have provided Cumbria County Council with these records. I've just got a few tiny uh, examples of records between 1686 and 1785 of baptisms of um, black servants, African servants, in, and some Indian servants in uh, Whitehaven and this is no coincidence because Whitehaven was at one point the second biggest importer of tobacco and it also had a, a not insubstantial slave trading history also but if there are as you can see 61 people listed between 1686 and 1785 alone it just shows how much there is left to do in this area and I will now pass over to Emma and try to stop sharing my screen. Fantastic, thank you ever so much, Corinne. Thank you. Um, so one of the things we asked both Gretchen and Corinne to do um, was to perhaps pose a question to Simon. If there's anything they, in the first instance, would like to ask Simon about the book, I'd like, first of all, to give um, both Gretchen and Corin an opportunity. Um, we've also got our question and answers feature down here on Zoom. Um, I can see some questions have already come in, so I encourage the audience to start putting their questions in there. Um, let's first see, first of all, if Gretchen and Corin have anything to throw over to Simon, and um, we'll then pass over to Simon before we go over to the floor. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm so fascinated by these. As Corin knows, I'm, I also follow these finds that people are, are just uh, finding with these pictures and the images and how freedom seekers go far beyond London. By concentrating on the metropole, you're able to concentrate in one area. But as Corin just showed, there's so much more out there and spreads all over, all over Britain. My question is actually something that comes up early in the book and, and it has to do with, with style. Um, it, you open the book with the story of a freedom seeker named Ben. By, but using it, you borrow kind of literary and historical devices similar to what people like Sadia Hartman 
uh, does in her books, Lose Your Mother and Wayward Lives. That is, you use these available scraps of history, because that's what they really are, is just scraps, little bits of pieces of, of knowledge to try to build a fuller picture of a life using the imagination. What was that life? What would it have looked like? Where would they have walked, eaten, dressed? What, how would they have left? And you write that we can never know Ben's life story, yet deep and expansive historical research may enable us to imagine something of his lived experience. And I was hoping you could say something about the role of the imagination in combination with known facts, because you've got lots of facts to fill out this picture of people who cannot speak for themselves. Thank you. Should I, do you want to ask your question, question too, Corinne, and then I'll respond? Actually, my, we didn't confer on questions, but my question was something similar, but one which is um, asking whether if you use literary sources as a kind of ethical stance in the ways that we've discussed already, whether that then leaves you open to, you know, a more a cynical criticism that you're elaborating or making up the evidence, because I know that has been a problem in the past when very serious historians who are doing evidence based work have embarked on this kind of project. Yes, both really good questions. Um, I think it took me to about the eve of retirement to have the courage to try and do this, um, what I do here and allow myself to imagine, but, but try very carefully never to go too far beyond what I could find in the archives or what I could justify or explain. Um, I think at one point in an earlier version of this book, one of the readers said, you're using the word possible or possibly several hundred times here. Um, and it's, in, it's inevitable with this kind of work, uh, because if I didn't imagine, if I didn't lay out some possible scenarios regularly, there wouldn't be, there would be no stories here because the evidence base isn't strong enough. Um, and I think I was encouraged in doing some of this by working with young black creative writers. Um, and seeing how they responded to the, exactly the same material I had um, and took ownership of it and then began to imagine stories behind it. Um, I think there is a place for this in some of our historical work and that it should be encouraged, but I think we have to be really, really careful. Um, and nor do I want to in any sense try and take ownership of these stories and make them my stories. The whole point is to try and uncover other people's stories or at least allow us to imagine them, um, but they shouldn't become mine. Fantastic. Um, let's move over. Thank you all. Um, as I predicted, rather a lot of questions have started to come into the chat and I do encourage everybody to keep piling your questions into the chat. It is such a fascinating topic and we really want to hear um, questions that you have either for Simon or more generally for the panel. I'm going to um, move over now and start a quest with a question from Susan Armisen. She says, I'm really excited to read the book and I love the way you've traced the elements in the advertisements. I wonder if you could talk more about the free black population and the role they may have played in helping the freedom seekers. Well, it's nice. Uh, thank you for coming, Susan. Your work's been really important here. So it's, it's lovely to have you here. Um, Again, it's so difficult to know. I know there's a free black population and I know where it's beginning to, the focal points that are beginning to develop in the East End, south of the river, and then across in, in the city of London too. Um, I find them in the parish records. They're occasionally in the court records, but how is that as a community allowing or enabling escape? Um, I haven't got a single piece of evidence to demonstrate that. Not one. So again, this is where imagination comes in. I'm sure it's happening. But I, I think what really intrigued me too, as someone who spent most of my career working on North America, um, is that imagining a, uh, an escapee in Jamaica, I can only imagine that person escaping to the black community, whether enslaved or free. In London, I can imagine escapees escaping to the white community. Um, there are enough examples of marriages and baptisms of children of multiracial couples to show that free black people are, are forming alliances and families with white people, that the racial boundaries are just not as fixed in London yet as they are in the colonies. So I think there's escape 
to and aiding by the black free black community. But I think it's not just the free black community. And that's that makes London really interesting at this time. What do you think, Gretchen and Corinne? Yeah, I was gonna say, Gretchen, what, what, go on, tell us what you think as well. When I teach this in America, the students are amazed to find out that there were no laws against racial intermarriage. They, they can't even imagine that this was a, a problem, um, that this was not a problem. And when I show them some of the prints that show people together, some of the records that show these marriages and friendships, they are just astonished because they don't even realize that Britain had through its colonies, such a huge enslaved population. They think it was entirely an American invention. So I think it's very important for you to talk about the fact that we cannot necessarily document all of the, the freed people. And in fact, some people, uh, I'm thinking of Kathy Chater and others have tried to trace back some of the people who that we think of as the Sons of Africa or those groups that write to the newspapers. And they can't actually document everything, but we do know that they turned out what you would know the case of someone who was put into prison and what 300 people came to help and to feed yeah. and to, to keep him company. So we do know there was a black community. It wasn't just a person here and a, and a person mm -hmm. there. It really is so fascinating. Thank you both very much. Let me move on to a question from um, Jamie Gemmell. Um, who writes, thanks for this hugely important book. I should say many people are putting in the comments what a fantastically important and interesting book it is as well, Simon. So I will keep feeding that message through to you. Um, but they continue, would you say a little, would you talk a little bit about the relationship between the English state and, the, and these individuals? I'm thinking specifically of a legal case from 1677, Butts versus Penny, which created a legal precedent for racial slavery within England and its empire. Holly Brewer discusses this case extensively and imitates Imtiaz Habib ends his text with it, concluding that it changed what he called black citations in the early modern archive. Um, I think that would be a fantastically um, interesting context setting question for many of us um, who are non experts in this field as well. Simon, if I could pass that to you. Right. Um, well, I'm not a legal historian like Holly and, and the others, but I think what struck me is that my previous book was on the creation of plantation slavery in Barbados, which is where it really all begins for the, the English. Um, and I was struck by, and the history I was used to was that in those colonies, very quickly, a very complex legal system develops to control and define the enslaved population, to define them as, as real property, as chattel property, um, to define what can be done to them and how they can be controlled. So the Barbados Slave Code of 1661, the first comprehensive slave code that will be copied in Jamaica, South Carolina, throughout the American Deep South, almost two thirds of it is about what you do with runaway slaves or rebels. Um, it's about controlling and punishment of this population. But in the British Isles, although what Corinna and Gretchen and Kathy Chader and Miranda and a lot of other great scholars have, have shown is there is a, a significant but largely forgotten black population. Even though there is that population, it's a tiny part of the British population and there isn't the same legal need to define and control it, but there is in somewhere like Jamaica, where there are 12 enslaved people for every one white person. Um, so yes, you get legal cases like that, but at the same time, you get completely different things happening elsewhere because there isn't a consistent legal process. And you know, long after slavery has been abolished in Britain, as we consider with the Somerset case, there are still Americans bringing enslaved people to London, like John Jay in 1794, 95, who then take them back to slavery in America. That's not supposed to happen, it's still happening. So I think the law is not a sufficient guide to tell us exactly what's happening. It can tell us what's happening occasionally in places, but it doesn't tell you the whole story. It's much more complicated and messy. Thanks, um, Simon. Loads of questions coming in, and uh, there have been a number around um, some of the um, the details and the processes. So Gad Hoyman and I think others have said, you know, put a slightly similar question as asking, well, thank you for your presentation. Um, sorry, I can't just move this around. Could you expand on the process of the capture and the return of the runaways? Um, and I think there's a, a few other people really asking about kind of what happens when they're out there. Um, uh, you know, are they being returned? Who's finding them? And what's, could you tell something about the mechanics of this process, how it plays yes. out? Um, 
And the short answer is, I don't know. Uh, a successful escape means someone has disappeared, which means you don't, they're not going to appear in the records. Um, an, unsu an unsuccessful escape where someone is recaptured or comes back or whatever very quickly, again, there's not going to be another advertisement. How are we going to know what happened? Um, the rare occasions when I can see some of what's happened is when the same person appears in several advertisements. So I can see that they have managed to stay free for a lengthy period of time. Or in a couple of cases, I have people who escape and then escape again a year or two years later. And sometimes the second advertisement tells you what happened. So my favorite is a boy who escaped. And then he was the enslaved property of the person he escaped from. But he then hired himself out as a free laborer doing exactly the same kind of servant work to someone else on the other side of London. Um, and it's only because he escapes again and these two white men finally get together and talk about what's happened that the first person is able to communicate in the second advertisement what happened. So occasionally I can see what's happening, but in most cases, there's just no way of knowing. I think we're talking about a largely male population and many of them young. I'm sure a lot of them are either joining ships or working um, in the construction industry in London. The amount of construction going on after the fire of London and in London's expansion is just off the charts and the guilds are losing control. So if you're strong, you can get work. And if you can get onto a ship, they're multiracial, the crews of ships. So I think some are going there. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question I think um, uh, I, th I think it's really uh, germane to all of you in the various different projects that you've been doing over the, over the past few years. Marianne Galley says, thank you for all these presentations. How did the collaboration across research and artistic areas work in terms of academic research towards, uh, she says, the construction of the book, but I think both Corinne and Gretchen have also been involved in projects that have um, used a, you know, really mingled um, traditional academic research and speaking with other audiences and presenting kind of historical findings in, in different areas. And I think it would be wonderful to hear from all of you about this kind of the collaborative processes involved in bringing this Black British history to life. Corinne and Gretchen, could I ask you first? Well, I think what's been fascinating is, first of all, people are starting to get to know other people who are doing similar work. It wasn't always the case that you knew other people who were doing the same thing. And it's, it's quite wonderful to see that someone brings another perspective. Um, I'm, I'm in literature, but I write historical things. Corin does things with country houses, but also with art. And it's wonderful to see that the same person that she might be thinking about who's in a painting might be someone that I'm thinking about who might appear in a novel um, or in some version of a novel. And one of the really nice things is seeing that people are now taking this research and creating their own work from this kind of research that isn't just purely historical research. I was reading, rereading um, just this week, I read, first of all, I reread Patterson Joseph's play, Sancho. And then the next week, we read Incomparable World by S.I. Martin, which is reimagining 18th century London. And before that, they'd read a, histor a historical piece. And they suddenly got this whole picture of what 18th century London looked like by taking these various pieces from the different arts and putting it together. And they, they would say things like, oh, now I know what it looked and smelled like, what it was like to be a Black person. Where could you go to hide? What was this like? So I think this is very much something that we're going to see much more of, not just the collaboration among scholars, but among all kinds of creative people. Yeah, absolutely. And um, for Colonial Countryside, as I mentioned, I commissioned 10 pieces of short stories or poetry cycles connected to the histories of each of 10 different National Trust houses. And I gave you a short example there in my presentation. But the way that this worked was quite interesting, especially in relation to some of Simon's earlier comments, in that I had a team of historians working closely with those commissioned writers. And sometimes the historians, not only were they directing those writers to particular archives and secondary sources also, but they were having quite detailed fine-grained conversations about what was and wasn't historically viable. And there were even in extreme cases, um, historians vetoing certain things in the books 
uh, in the in the sorry in the commission's writing because no that's not historically accurate and you can't go there um and yet on the other side of things and that was fine but obviously there's a bit of tension between artistic license and historical expertise and insistence upon kind of rigor um but it wasn't a problem the writers absolutely loved working with the historians in this way and the other um quite striking thing about it is that one of the writers embarked on a kind of flight of fancy which later turned out to be historically absolutely accurate relating to speak hall and he'd intuited it but also through his understanding of historical context the he it with almost pinpoint accuracy he came up with a, a story which had initially troubled the um some of the people involved on the research side but actually turned out to be um a really horrific incident that did actually happen and that we then found evidence for so i think that that is absolutely fascinating that process of intuition creativity and that foundation of research expertise it's a brilliant kind of dialogue that comes and, to that. and i think it, it's a two-way street it's not simply that historians are giving information to creative writers and artists and so forth it's that as you say corinne we then learn we the historians learn new ways of looking at our material from what people come up with and uh working with moyo and Mariah akande who've made this wonderful film 1745 about this two sisters escaping um, from an enslaver in scotland um just hearing them talking about what it felt like to have a metal collar fixed around their the neck um in filming even though these are 21st century powerful young women how how it felt and not to be able to see what was written on it only to be able to feel it and, and so i think there are all kinds of ways we as historians can learn from this this dialogue with with young people with creative artists um, and look at our own work differently I, I should also mention that because I worked with 100 children on colonial countryside, they asked completely different questions of the mm -hmm. archive. And I think that's important. They also very strongly identified with the children in the paintings because that, that was, those children were roughly their age. Yeah. So the sorts of questions they asked were absolutely fundamentally different to one that I might ask. Fascinating. Um, I'm going to scoop up a number of questions here because there are more than we'll ever get through. Um, but I've had some questions about the average, about, about the people um, themselves, uh, the, the people are being described in these adverts. And um, one anonymous person has asked um, any women. Another is asking about the age. Um, and Daniel Moskovitz is also saying they're primarily about boys and young men. Um, beyond the peeps example, what happened as the enslaved grew older? So if there's anything you can say about age, uh, gender, and aging um, amongst this population, that would be great. Really, really good questions. Um, the gender is strikingly male. Um, of these advertisements, 94% are, are male. Um, and if you look at freedom seekers in the colonies, the proportion or percentage of female freedom seekers is higher. It can be as high as 25, 26%, depending where you are. Um, so it's very low. And when we look at the parish records in London that mention people of color, um, we're looking at a much higher proportion of female, um, probably about a quarter. Um, still not anything like balance, but it's significantly more. So were there fewer enslaved females? Um, probably, but I also think running away in London is, is very tricky and dangerous for a 12-year-old black girl. I, I don't know. Then the, the question of age, um, they're very young. They're much younger than freedom seekers in the colonies. Um, I, of those whose ages I can be fairly sure of, of over 60% are teenaged or younger. The youngest I found is eight. Um, so they're very young. And I think it's about what some people have described as a fashion for young boys, which we see in the portraits Corinne and, and Gretchen have talked about. Another question, I'll move on to a question about sources as well, actually, um, from Melanie Back Hansen. She says, hello, I wonder if you could find the most, uh, what you found the most to be the most useful source for finding references to black people. You've mentioned and used newspapers, artwork, parish registers. 
Are there other key sources you might suggest or recommend for the period, or are they the main sources? And Gretchen, of course, I think we'd love to hear from you as well about your experience of finding sources um, for this. Well, yes, I mean, the, the records are difficult, as Simon would say, because not everybody kept records according to race. So you cannot always tell that a person who's referenced is in fact a person of color or not. If it strikes the person taking the record down, then that person might have mentioned it. Or if the person is associated with a household and they would say, this person is of this household or this family. Um, so the records are very difficult to find. And I, you know, I'm, I, I do get constantly asked because like many of you, I'm working on another book and people write to me and say, can I have all of your sources, please? And I'd say, you don't know how difficult these are to come by. And some of it is serendipitous. I found a marriage with a black woman and a white man in a, a very, in, where was I? It was a, it wasn't Bedford, but it was a town where I didn't expect to find someone. And the person, and it was just an accident that I ran across this. There's so many things we will never know. And I think the best way is to just keep going through the files. In America, perhaps in Britain as well, because I know this works, um, it's genealogists and family historians who are doing some of the best tracking. If they are very careful and understand the records, they are the ones who are often finding things that others cannot find um, just by using traditional archival resources. Yes, so I, I was just going to only add, it, uh, in the in week five of the online course on country houses, we do have a list which Simon helped helped us with on types of evidence and, and sources. And we have a list, uh, diaries, gravestones, household records and accounts, inventories, legal records, letters, local newspapers, escape slave notices, obviously, um, sale notices, um, parish registers, portraits, state papers, tax returns, wills and voyage records um, were some of the ones which, which we've got listed there. I think I was fortunate in working with sort of one set of records primarily, although it took quite a long time and the help of many other people to find these advertisements. But when I look at the work of, of the two of you and people like Catherine Molyneux, Kathy Chader, Miranda Kaufman, um, Susan Amerson, in Taz Habib, the way tiny snippets of information, needles in haystacks have been pieced together to tell large stories is remarkable because it's very hard to find this stuff. I think, especially if you get into the 18th century, newspapers are great, but you really, word searching is a very unreliable source. If they're digitized, you won't always catch things. You really need to read them and it takes a long time, but there are a lot of stories and little snippets of information in the newspapers. Can I just, just, sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry, I was just throw in and say there was a question about um, digital sources as well. And just before we wrap up on this, as if anybody's got things to say about digital archives and how that they can be brought in, I'd love to hear that as well. Sorry, Corin, you speak. Yeah, sorry. No, I was only just going to um, chip in and say that because this is such labour intensive work, and because it is a shared history, it, I think that there's so much scope for mass research projects. Yeah. Um, and, and collaboration over this yes. because there are many, many people who are interested in assisting with, with this work. And I was thinking, just as you were speaking, Simon, that uh, I one time once put out a tweet asking if anybody wanted to volunteer to uh, for this kind of research. And I got, I don't know, 250 emails of people volunteering in 10 days and I just had to put out another tweet to say please stop because I couldn't cope with it but what that showed is the appetite for working together locally mm -hmm. and um, in order to sift through some of this material. Well a good example of that if anyone's interested in, in looking at these London parish records is the London Metropolitan Archives new database switching the lens which is about people of color in, in London parish records. And that was a group sourced project. Um, so exactly what you're talking about, Corinne. 
Susan, I wonder actually, and there's so many questions, I just I don't know where to go with some of them, but we've had some questions actually um, just on that um, about the kind of the creation of the work. We've also had a question, um, let's just get so I can see who asks it. Oh, gosh, they, they vanish really quickly. Um, about the fact that you've created the book open access and that Gretchen some of your work is also available freely on open access um, and I just think actually that's a really interesting thing to ask as well about how this has changed um, the you know maybe why you why you've made this choice uh, and what the broader significance of that is as well it's an anonymous question well I, as you know Emma I was involved in creating the open access um, series for first time um, history authors for the Royal Historical Society. And I was really excited by the potential to reach so many people. I've done research in places like um, West Africa and the Caribbean and seen university libraries that don't have great resources and can't afford great resources and realizing what a huge global audience there is for good work that is freely available, but also wanting to reach beyond um, my normal audience of a few hundred academics. Um, and that's exciting. So, Gretchen? Well, I was just going to say that when Black England went out of print, because it was published 26 years ago, I, about 15 years ago, had my university library make it available as a digital copy. That's going to end soon because the book is now being republished in the UK uh, with a new introduction and new information. and. I think the publisher wants to have that um, to themselves, but open access is such an important thing that university libraries often are pushing to have possible. I don't know how many are going to be doing it, how many will or will not, but the bigger question is who has access to that? Not everybody has access to a university library. And even though it's wonderful that some of them are doing that, how is it that people, the public, the general public get access to that material and that information. And I don't know if Simon might know the answer to that, but I know it's been a stumbling block for a lot of people doing the search. And Corinne, uh, the National Trust book of colonial properties, that is open access too, right? The, the book that came out a few years ago. Um, which one, the... Um... The collection of historical essays. Um, oh matter. yeah, no, that's not out yet. Um, that oh. that's uh, that's the book of commissions, and it's it, it will be affordable because it mm. it will be okay. through People Tree Press. But right. I mean, obviously, the National Trust report, the spirit of that was as a starting point to show people what research had been done already, um, and that is open access. Anyone can read that, and lots of journalists did. Well, they didn't. They downloaded it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, switch focus. I've got a couple of questions about some of the, I suppose, the language and the methodology of what you're doing, Simon, and of course, very relevant to Gretchen um, and Corin as well. Melina Pilati says, um, do you think we should stop using words such as slave and slavery in favour of enslaved person and enslavement in order to give more weight to both the violent epistemologies and the subtle forms many found to retain? the agency and individuality. And I, I know you discussed that in the book, Simon, but I'm sure yeah. um, you may all have something to say on that. And also from Sophie Merricks, um, when, they, when um, things go into the chat, they hide what I'm trying to read, there we go. Um, asking, oh, another one's gone in there. <laughs> yeah. um, a bit of a methodological question. Um, how do you distinguish between the free black population and the enslaved black population? both in adverts and in any other range of um, record, any other kind of record, record as well. Black boy, for example, that tells us something about um, African identity, but not necessarily enslavement. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on those, those kind of you know, um, real classic historical challenges that we yes. have and kind of linguistic conventions. Right. Thank you, Sophie. Sophie's working on a dissertation on, on black people in 17th century England. So she's really on the ball here. Um, it's, it's very hard to tell sometimes. The word slave doesn't appear in a single advertisement in the 17th century. It becomes much more common in the 18th century advertisements in the British Isles, but not in the 17th century. And that really mystified me at first until people like Naomi Tadmore, who we know from the Royal Historical Society, um, her work was really influential here, showing that <clears throat> um, King James Bible, the Geneva Bible, they don't use the word slave. They use the word servant. 
even talking about the Israelites escaping from Egypt, they're servants. They talk about bondage and service. Um, so the word servant could be used for enslaved people. Um, it's really colonial language of slavery coming over in the 18th century that changes that. So the language used at the time isn't a realistic guide. And sometimes it's, it's about reading the evidence of, is a person branded? Do they have a collar on? I don't think you're doing that to someone who you consider to be free. Um, so sometimes there's evidence like that. And other times it's just trying to read. Not all of the people I have here were enslaved. Some were servants, and there's certainly evidence of people who become free over time. Um, I think what for me is important is the potential for so many people to be re-enslaved or to have their, their circumstances changed and the attitude of the people who control them. If those people think they own them, um, then, then there is the potential for them to really feel enslaved. Language is, is so tricky, and which is why I wrote a little piece about it at the beginning of the book. And in 10 years time, the language I use here will be out of date. It's shifting so quickly. I think all we can do at the moment is try to be as sensitive as possible and use language that doesn't objectify people, that acknowledges they were individuals, even if their agency was limited. So that's why the word slave is problematic. Um, more and more university presses and publications are saying we should capitalize black and white when we're referring to people's ways, race, and I think that makes sense. Um, so I, I don't think there are uh, right answers here, there are wrong answers. I think it's just a question of being really careful and explaining what you're trying to do. I think this is also a, a good place to say that language shifts over time and with other research and um, more types of awareness when in the 80s and 70s we might have comfortably used the terms um, slave or negro or any of those things then capitalized as, as a positive term now those terms have gone out of vogue and are taken to be negative and so i remember just making the shift from slave to enslaved person. Um, and then in America, of course, it got very complicated about the, all the nomenclature for people of color. And I think that's still something that is surprising to people to find the word black to refer to South Asian people as it would have been in Britain, but not in the United States. So this language is going to be just like our knowledge, perpetually evolving and changing. And I think we have to be very careful not to um, think negatively about older works that might have used terminology that has now gone out of vogue, but that to say that people were trying to be respectful and do the correct, correct thing in terms of language, but it is constantly changing. And, and I couldn't agree more, Simon, uh, that in, in 10, 20 years time, the, the language we're using now is, is going to be seen as hopelessly outdated in some way. <laughs> Couldn't agree more, it's so complicated. Um, we, we um, our, our session ends at quarter past seven. And before we close, I'd love to hear a word from uh, Simon, Horan and Gretchen, um, just to wrap up um, what they've in their final thoughts and the thing perhaps they most want to say about Simon's book and about um, this contribution to our understanding. But we have got time for a few more questions, just going to squeeze in a couple. Um, and just uh, returning specifically back to your um, book, Simon, um, oh, there's so many, they jump around, but this one, uh, I'd love to hear something about um, your use of, um, from Carol Smith, she says an elegant book. Can you talk a little to your use of imagery and especially the examples of editions by Triana Lawrence and Cara Walker's Fond Americanus and how these might enable a similar creative um, dialogue. And we also just had a question about where the slaves, the enslaved people go, where they, once they've left, what, what kind of places do they pitch up in? Um, uh, do they turn up in literary places? Um, are, are they found? So it's a little bit more um, uh, questions are being probed about what happens as so far as we can tell um, and where people might end up. Right, um, well, Triona Lawrence is my very talented niece who needed something to do during the summer of COVID, one of the summers of COVID. And so I gave her the advertisements and we talked a lot about the clothing um, for each chapter of the little mini chapters focuses particularly on one advertisement. 
and she drew each of those people. And again, it's an example of how the creative arts can change what I think as a historian using mainly textual records is to see the person I was trying to imagine and write about made a huge difference. Um, in the end, the best way in the book I was able to use her images was in that big scene of the fully populated Royal Exchange where many people would bring enslaved servants with them to attend them, to run errands and do things like that. And just to place them in there and say, these people were present. Um, that, that we have to remember that this was a, a city with a black population. Um, so I think the potential for playing with images, adding things, changing them. Um, yes, I'm messing with a historical source. I do that all the time. I mess with historical sources when they're textual. We all do, that's, that's writing history. I, I think if we are careful, we can mess with visual sources too, as long as we're honest about what we're doing and why we're doing it. You know, I'm really fascinated by this the part of the question because there are people like Lubena Hamid who are doing new kinds of imagery of, of people from that period and others who are doing the same thing, who are putting themselves into the images, you know, the, and so that's quite wonderful. But the Kara Walker I, was very startling when it appeared that, that I saw the question, that sculpture, the sugar one, which was uh, really shockingly received by people who didn't know the context and they didn't realize and people were taking photographs of each other in front of what they saw as just a rather prurient, almost pornographic image rather than understanding the point that she was trying to make about how a black woman's body had, might have been seen, especially because it's made of sugar. And um, they were really surprised if someone went up to them and said, oh, please don't do that. That's disrespectful. This is about something else. This is about our ancestors. <laughs> and, and I think it's really important that those contextual things be available to them. And you know, we, we see these people as being through our own modern lens and not always able to see what it was that this author or artist is, is trying to, to portray. I just had to get that in there because I remember seeing a video about it and I was shocked. <laughs> question. Okay, just a couple more questions before we uh, start wrapping up. Um, another question about um, whether they might have from Terence Graham. Um, do you think they would have hidden in sight by staying in London or tried to leave the country? What kind of options are there for people who are running um, occupations? I know you've covered a little bit about occupations, but if there's anything more you can say about occupations, I think that would be interesting. Um, uh, let's leave it there. Let's go with those two, Simon. There are a couple of examples of people who, in the advertisement, uh, the advertiser suggests they've left London. But I think in in most cases, they're staying in London, and there are certainly advertisements that say someone ran away in Bristol, I'm sure he's gone to London, and he's advertising in a London newspaper. I think at this time, London is the magnet. I think as we move into the 18th century, there are black, the black population is spread much more around the British Isles, and there's the potential to be in other places. Um, I do think a lot of the young men join ships. I can't prove that, but I, I have more evidence in the 18th century. In the 18th century, I even have one person who escapes and is there's a second advertisement for him two years later because his enslaver believes he's just come back from serving on a slave ship, that he'd actually left London, gone to West Africa, the Caribbean, and come back to London, serving on a slave ship, which really messes with our thinking about what's going on here. Um, there's, there's such a wide range of possibilities. We do know of a few free people, people who are eventually freed. One of them becomes the first black lighthouse keeper in, in Britain, in Essex, I think, Essex or Kent, I can't remember. Um, so who knows? There is a wide, this is a population which is becoming multiracial and there are various possibilities. Fascinating. Um, so many questions coming. There's been a lot of um, talk in the chat, which I'm afraid I haven't been able to fully keep on top of. Um, but I would love to say at this point that what is what I am catching in the chat is people saying this is absolutely fascinating. They absolutely love the book. They are so interested to hear what all of you are saying. Um, the topic is so rich um, and they're just really grateful to everybody for their thoughts and their insights. Um, and we've clearly got people from different parts of the world um, where this kind of research is in different um, 
stages of development and where there are points of comparison. I haven't put those to you as I feel sometimes it's very difficult when somebody says, what about in this part of the world? And um, your answer might be, well, I don't study that part of the world. But I think it just really draws to light the fact that there's a kind of a global and transnational history here that can be written. And the topic is so goes so, so far beyond the, the borders of London or of 18th century Britain, Restoration London. It is just such a, a huge, rich topic. And it's been wonderful seeing all these comments coming in. Um, well, I've got an eye on the time, and I think it's probably time to start thinking about wrapping up. And I'd like to do that. I, I, I know there are many questions that I haven't been able to put to you. And I know um, Gretchen and Corin haven't been able to kind of come in and answer, uh, you know, respond to all of these questions, some of which are specific to Simon's book. But it would be lovely to hear from all of you about directions, uh, about how you feel the state of the field is going, directions, anything specific about Simon Simon's book, any final comments or thoughts that you would like to share. We've got a, we've had, I should also emphasize, I don't think the audience can see this. We've had a massive audience of well over 200 people on this Friday night. So it clearly is a subject um, that many of us, many, many people are interested in. So um, over to you, should we start with, um, should we go, should we go through in the order or do the reverse order? Should we start with you, Corin? any final thoughts you'd like to say and then? and then Simon can wrap up. Um, yes, I mean, my, the, my main thought is read the book and download it if you haven't got a hard copy. Um, I, I think I also just wanted to emphasize how much more work there is to do. Um, in, in 10, 20 years time, we're gonna know so much more about uh, these presences and, and that includes beyond London. So it's a really important contribution. Thank you, Simon. I, I am so pleased that this book has been published because there is so much pushback against this history and that the more that we unearth these facts and that more that you can put out there, the kinds of information that you've put out there, Simon, and others have put out there, the better to kind of squash quash some of these terrible things that people say there is you know that thing that happened with me when i first was writing this book 25 30 years ago that still goes on and you can just be sure that anything that gets published is going especially in the newspapers is going to get pushed back against people who say this history did not exist and i think it, the more these books get published the more it becomes irrefutable and we are, as Corinne just said, going to be knowing so much more in 10 or 20 years. And hopefully that will put some of this, these objections, the xenophobia to, to rest. Yeah. And I think it's not just xenophobia, it's ignorance. Um, I'm thinking of the, that um, David Lammy, the Black Labour politician, former cabinet minister, who on his radio program a couple of years ago was speaking with a caller who told him he couldn't call himself English or British because he was black, even though he'd been born in London. Um, and it, it's ignorance and showing how strong the black presence was in the British Isles, how important it is in, in British history changes that. And I think we, for me, it's, it's been telling stories, telling stories of individuals as best I can, or at least uncovering details of those stories, because that's how we relate, most of us relate to the past and the big significant issues is through people. Um, and that was the really fun thing about this book is imagining these people. Absolutely. Well, I, will, I would love to, well, thank you. Well, congratulations, first and foremost, to you, Simon. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk us through some of the issues and respond to these questions. Also, obviously, Gretchen and Corin, thank you ever so much for making it such a fascinating um, conversation that we've had this evening. I'd love to thank our audience, such a great audience. I, I, I must apologize, so many questions came in. I've not been able to put even a fraction of the questions or some of the, the chat things. I just have not been able to get through quite so much material and listen at the same time. Um, I've not been trying to make any kind of judgment as to which questions get put and which ones don't. Um, there's just really a lot of material to get through and um, a lot to listen to at the same time as trying to read it. So thank you all very much for your um, engagement um, with us um, tonight. I will just close by just um, a little plug for our next RHS events on Tuesday, the 8th of March. We've got a training workshop for early career researchers um, and that's on applying for your first teaching post in history. 
Like all our events, it's free and it's open to all. So do join us if you're at that stage of your career or you think you might be soon and you'd like to know more. And on Tuesday, the 22nd of March, we've got another book launch and panel, this time for a recent new historical perspectives title. So that's another open access title that you can all access for free that we publish in collaboration with the University of London Press. It's an edited collection called Precarious Professionals that explores the theme of precarity in work in a historical perspective. For now, though, all uh, it leaves for me to do is to say good night to everybody. Thank you. Um, and good luck with this weather, everybody. Good night. Bye.